Good morning, everybody. So, let me get my timer started. So today I'm going to talk to you about the future of uh, retail. I am a futurist, and as I tell my company, there's three things that you can always depend on in life. Death, taxes, and shopping. So these are things is why that, that retail, and it's something that I've been looking at for the past 15 years in my career, looking at the future of retail and where things are going. So what I want to do today is talk a little about what I do as a futurist, how I look out to the future, because I think that's what you're all here to do, is to certainly see what's going on, but see the possibilities. But what I want to do is take you a little further out into the future, about 10 to 15 years, so that you can turn around and look backwards and view what you see today, give you a little context to sort of look into the future. So we're going to start with this slide. If you read this slide very closely, it says, I work for a large company, and we have a lot of lawyers. <laughs> OK, let's move on. <clears throat> So, I'm Brian David Johnson, I'm a futurist. I look 10 to 15 years in the future and model how people will act and interact with technology. Essentially, I model what it will feel like to be a human and live in the future. Now, I do that for governments and militaries, I do it for startups, I do it for trade organizations, and I also do it for large corporations. I am the futurist at Intel. I was actually the first futurist appointed at Intel. And the reason why Intel has a futurist is because it takes them about 10 to 15 years to design, develop, and deploy a chip. So it's of vital business importance today for them to know what people will want to do 10 years from now. I'm a principal engineer at the company. I write a spec. So the work that I do is very pragmatic. I have to, I am judged on my ability to give people a vision for the future, but then also allow them to do something with it. Now, you can pretty much tell everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture. Now, I know you all have a lot of taste, and you're all very refined, so I'm going to help you. You need to look right down here. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a calculator watch, <laughs> thus proving that I am a nerd. <laughs> I, I love everything science. I love everything science fiction, and these things come together in the work that I do. So let's talk about that vision for the future. So typically, when we're shown images of what the future is going to look like, we're shown this, right? We have to have a vision for the future if we're going to build the future. So typically, we're shown this. You've got a, a really good-looking guy or a really good-looking gal. You're, they've got a really nice sort of streamlined piece of technology, and they're in a really cool apartment, right? This is what we're normally shown. Now, I have to tell you, I hate this picture. The reason why I hate this picture is because when I look at this picture, I ask myself, where are the baby toys? I ask myself, where are the pillows? Where are the, where are the family photos? Where are the things? Where's the stuff that makes us comfortable? That's what's lovely about human beings is that we're complicated. We have different cultures and different beliefs. That's what makes us amazing. So when I look at this, I find this, at best, intellectually dishonest. At worst, I find it insulting. I find it insulting to how awesome human beings can be. Now, on my next slide, I have a picture of what the future is actually going to look like. Who would like to see it? <coughs> Remember, you're not in England anymore. And by the way, half of you didn't even raise your hand. <laughs> really? <laughs> go, go, go ahead. There's people would love to sit down, by the way, if you'd like to. OK, no, but so I got to tell you, I spent a lot of time in front of audiences, especially students. And I was in front of about 600 undergraduate engineering students, also known as the hardest audience on Earth. You are all pussycats compared to them. So I'm there, I'm Intel's futurist. I'm like, who wants to see the future? Completely silent, except for one kid way in the back who goes, sure. <laughs> I come all the way and all I get is, sure. OK, here we go. You ready? You cannot unsee what you are about to see. Like literally, you will mark this day in your life. You will go home, you will tell your children about this day. It's basically this day and after this day. If you're good at it, your children's children will tell their children, because you saw the future. You ready? <coughs> Hold on to your neighbor. Bam! <laughs> now, the reason why I love this, by the way, pound for pound in my world, this has more technology in it, more future in it than the previous one. But what I love about it is she's got stuff. There's stuff on the chest of drawers, the drawer's open, she's in her bare feet, it's human. This is the type of world I want to design for. And as you start to envision the future today, and when you leave here, let's imagine futures that are designed for real people and for the complexity of real people. So the thing that has been driving me as a technological futurist is on this slide. 
And what this says is that as we approach the year 2020, the size of meaningful computational power, the size of the chip that goes into all of our devices, begins to approach zero. Now today we're at about 14 nanometers, we're moving close to about 5 nanometers. 5 nanometers is 10 atoms across. It basically means we can turn anything into a computer. We could turn this podium into a computer, we could turn my jacket into a computer, we could even turn my body into a computer. So it changes the questions we have to ask ourselves because for decades we asked ourselves, can we do something? But now we know we can turn anything into a computer. And I actually think that unbounds our businesses and it unbounds what we can do in retail. So we have to ask ourselves what? What do we want to do and why? So the landscape of the future, what it will feel like to live 10 years in the future. Right? Today we live in a world of devices. We're going to talk a lot about devices. Right? We'll talk about you know, uh, smartphones and tablets and laptops. It's all about devices. But as you have the size of meaningful computational power moving to zero, that intelligence begins to move into the world around us. We have smart buildings, we have smart cities, we have smart cars, and something really interesting happens to all of those devices. All of those devices disappear. Okay, just so you know, all the money went into that animation. <laughs> so well, we're going to go back one, guys, if you could take us back one, because I really want you guys to, re now that you know it's coming, you're going to feel it. You're actually going to feel the future. So when you have the size of meaningful computational power approaching zero, something really interesting happens to all those devices. All those devices disappear. disappear. <laughs> there we go. That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> I know it's early. Exactly. <clears throat> so what happens, though, is those screens don't become less important. They actually become more important. They become the windows through which we tap into all of that intelligence. They become the windows through which we shop, that we interact, that we buy, and that we learn, and that we communicate. But how we architect our businesses, how we architect the world around us, is completely different. Now something else, which we're going to talk quite a lot about today, is this notion of the secret life of data. That as we move into the future, you'll have machines talking to machines and algorithms talking to algorithms. Data will have a secret life. So the question that I will put to you is, what will it be like when your store's data or your brand's data or your business's data starts interacting with your consumer's data or your customer's data or your employer's data and nobody has any interaction, no human being, it's just data to data? What is it like for your algorithm to talk to somebody else's algorithm? What is your brand, what is your business like online, what does your data say about you? Because we have to remember that as it goes out, and you can have these algorithms talking to algorithms and machines talking to machines, but all of that is meaningless until it comes back and touches the lives of people. Ultimately, retail, shopping, is about people. So that's the question that I always ask folks is as they tell me about these great new ideas and where they're going, I say, how is it going to make people's lives better? How is it going to make people healthier, happier, more productive? How will it solve a problem for them? Because if we set that as our goal, we can do really, really amazing things. Now, we're in a really interesting time right now. Right? We're in a time where devices are disappearing, where we are surrounded by computational intelligence. Literally, we are living inside of computers. Right? We will be able to optimize our environments. We will be able to walk around and you will be able to buy anything, anywhere. Your data will be able to talk to stores data. Right? The shopping experience will happen through the data and the algorithms and the computers going off and doing things for you and then coming back to you. So I believe we are in a time right now where our science and our technology have progressed to the point where what we build is only constrained by the limits of our imagination. And again, that's what I want to challenge you to think about today. Because what's holding us back, it's not our science, it's not our technology. I would argue it's not our business. It's not our ability to have a social network because we're even more connected than we were before. The thing that is holding us back is our imagination. It is our inability to imagine a far more awesome future than we're going to have today. That your imagination 
for yourself and for your colleagues and in your business that your imagination is the one skill that is not developed. And so that, that's what we need to push ourselves to do. So as a futurist, I take my job very seriously. I realize that if I get my job right, and I've been at Intel for about 13 years now, that I actually can touch the lives of almost every human being on the planet. Right? Computational power and intelligence has that power. I would argue that retail and shopping has that as well. Again, death, taxes, shopping. Things you cannot avoid. So I went out and said, well, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm an optimist. Right? I believe that the future is built by people. The future isn't an accident. The future doesn't just happen. The future is built by people every day. The future is built by businesses every day. And so you have to be an active participant in that future. You have to have a vision for the future and then do something about it. So I started asking myself, well, how do we do this? How do we change the future? If we, if we have a vision for the future, how do we change it? What do we do? And I came up with this, that the way that we change the future is we change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in. Really simple, but really powerful, because if you can change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in, they will make different decisions. Your company will do different things. And if you're working in retail, you know that retailing and the experience and the relationship you have with your customers and your employees is all a narrative. It's all a story. Everything you do, everything you create is an experience and a narrative. So you are experts at that. You are experts at telling that story. You are actually experts at imagining and building the future. That's why you're here. That's why you came to the Wired Retail event today. I would argue it's because you care about the future. That's why you took time. You're all very busy. You took time out to come and sit in this room and listening to an amazing agenda of speakers because you care. So you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do? You have this power. You have the power to shape the future not only of your own life and your family and your community, but your business. And because you're here today, you have the ability to shape the future of retail. So my question to you is, what will you do with it? How far can you go? How far can you push yourself to imagine? And please always remember that our goal should be to come up with great products, come up with great businesses, make a lot of money, great. But our goal should always be to touch the lives of people and make their lives better. Make them healthier, make them happier, make them more productive, make them laugh. But that should be our goal. And that's what we should aim for. My last slide takes a little bit of a story. Um, when I was coming up in industry, I used to write speeches for my executives. This was before I was at Intel. And I was very young, and I was working for an executive, and in every presentation I did for him, I had to include a picture of dogs playing poker. I was very young. I didn't ask why. I said, yes, sir. So in every picture, in every presentation we did together, I always included a picture of dogs playing poker. If there was a TV, there would be a picture of dogs playing poker. If there was a podium, I'd put a picture of dogs playing poker on the front of it. Right, you all know this picture, right? I know this picture really well. Right? It's got the little bulldog. He's got the card in his toe. I mean, I know this really well. Finally, when I was done with the company and he was moving actually to a different country, I got up the guts to ask him, and I said, sir, why do we have to include a picture of dogs playing poker in every single presentation that we did? And he smiled at me and said, Brian, people love pictures of dogs playing poker. <laughs> Why wouldn't you include dogs, pictures of dogs playing poker in every presentation that you give? And he was right. So in every presentation that I give, I don't include a picture of dogs playing poker. What I do include are pictures of animals using technology. <laughs> the longer you look at this, the more freaked out you're going to get. I want to say thank you very much. Please enjoy the day, and I'll see you in the future.